Hi, and welcome back to the 2021 virtual Nebraska Sorghum Symposium. My name is Nate Bloom. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Grain Sorghum Board of the Nebraska Sorghum Producers Association. And while we'd love to be with you in person, unfortunately, the pandemic has prevented that this year. But we're happy and glad to bring you uh, some excellent content and hopefully some valuable resources as you're ready to make your planting decisions for 2021. Here with us today to talk about the climate outlook is Mr. Michael McMahon. Mr. McMahon is the senior hydrometeorologist at HDR based out of Denver. So with that, Mr. McMahon, thanks for being with us. So I am a Mike McMahon. I'm senior hydrometeorologist, climate science and resiliency lead for HDR. I'm here to talk to you about the climate outlook for 2021 and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Oh, wait, wait, one more time. And the ugly of what this climate year is going to look like. So I, I've got to throw a little quick disclaimer for you. Otherwise, um, uh, the good folks in Omaha won't let me do this. Um, basically, um, I'm going to be providing guidance for the upcoming water year, which is truly a forecast, kind of what you get somewhere from the National Weather Service. However, um, uh, in many times, you don't you get a watered down version of what you really need to know. Uh, so uh, as long as I provide this disclaimer, which basically says I'm going to provide you guidance on what could be rather than what will be, um, uh, I can go ahead and provide this. Uh, DT DSTM, that's don't shoot the messenger. That's always been my go-to uh, as a forecaster uh, for the last 37 years. Um, uh, I will tell you what I believe is has the greatest likelihood. Um, however, that may not always agree with what you want to hear. Uh, so please do not shoot the messenger. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about um, the various parameters, which I'm sure every single person listening to this call understands about growing their sorghum in Nebraska. It's all about the uh, precipitation, uh, the air temperature, the um, <coughs> uh, sun, the amount of sunshine that, and or solar radiation that's going to be available. Uh, soil moisture, is there going to be enough? And then, of course, the timing. Timing is everything in farming. And when is that going to come? And how much and, and where um, uh, those parameters are going to become important to your growing of crops. So the star of this year's show is La Nina. La Nina represents one side of the hydroclimate index, or HCI, known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation. El Nino Southern Oscillation is all about global energy transfer. In other words, energy moving around the globe, which controls weather. <clears throat> we measure the hydroclimate index um, based on parameters that are uh, developed from uh, an area of the globe which takes up a large portion of the Pacific Ocean. It's not just sea surface temperatures. It goes deeper than that. It's sea level pressure. You got winds. You got um, obviously sea surface temperatures, but also subsurface temperatures and uh, going long wave radiation. Those are all measured and they're put into an index value. Now, that index value, which I'm going to show you how we use it in just a second, um, is called the Multivariate El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. It, um, the values range from 4.0 negative to 4.0 positive. Uh, any MEI that's under minus 0.5 is called a La Nina year. And anyone that's over 0.5 is called an El Nino year. Um, anything in between is a neutral situation. <clears throat> now, like I said, those are, those are values measured in the uh, Pacific Ocean from that area that you see circled there that says MEI, Multivariate El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. Um, the uh, uh, underlying map there shows you sea surface temperatures and uh, an understanding of what it means in a La Nina situation. In other words, a cooler than normal situation in the Central Pacific. 
Another uh, hydroclimate indice that we look at, uh, particularly for the central portion of the country, is called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Again, same parameters, but for a different area of the ocean. Now, take a, take a gander how big an area we're talking about measuring here, okay? That's really important to global circulations. Here is uh, the last three months of how that has changed. Well, it hasn't changed significantly. And in fact, the area of cold water in the Central Pacific has actually become a little bit more robust. Um, and that extends all the way through today. So how much energy were we talking about and why in the heck should we care about what goes on in the Central Pacific if we're forecasting for the Central Plains in the US? Well, how much energy? The El Nino Southern Oscillation occurs in the, in the Pacific Ocean. It can change the water temperature as much as eight degrees Fahrenheit to the depth of a hundred meters. That's the equivalent energy exchange of 20 quadrillion kilowatts of energy. The US annual energy outputs four trillion kilowatts of energy. So why do we look at these things? Because they're very telling as to what the global circulation is doing and what the weather is going to do in a given region based on what's going on in the Pacific Ocean. So I mentioned that uh, these are uh, unitless values um, that uh, give us an understanding of what's going on in this region of the Pacific Ocean. These correlations uh, between the index values that I told you about and precipitation, air temperature, stream flow in a given region, particularly your region, uh, can be used to determine um, <laughs> uh, through the use of these, datas, these data. Um, once the correlations are developed, they can be used as a preceding mode to forecast. Give me an example of that. So one of the one of the first things we always do in a given situation like this is we'll look at what's going on right now, 2020. What's it similar to in the past? Well, the best assembly that I could draw from the last from 1990 to 2020, last 30 years. Uh, is the, the latter part of 2011. If you remember the beginning part of 2011, it was pretty wet and um, the upper basin uh, in the Missouri River had a lot, a lot of snow on it and there was flooding. But the latter half of 2011 um, wasn't nearly as wet as the first half of 2011. And the La Nina situation that caused all that problem um, was dissipating into 2012. Well, if you look down here at 2020, these index values, which are made up from an understanding of what's going on with the global energy transfer, are very similar to what happened in the latter half of 2011. That's very telling and helps us decide what's going on. Well, where are we, where are we going in the rest of 20, <coughs> uh, 2021? is very similar to what happened in 2012 as well. Um, these are three month uh, uh, understanding of what the La Nina situation is expected uh, to do for the remainder of this year. And as you can see, here we are in November, December, January, December, January, February, La Nina is gonna be very strong throughout the winter months. Then is it dissipated, dissipate, and became a neutral situation by April, May, June. Um, so we're taking that historic information, we're combining it with the forecast information to help you guys better understand what's going to be going on for the remainder of this year in your growing area. Well, <laughs> these graphics are, are very telling as to the difference of uh, the United States experience experiences during either an El Nino condition or a La Nina condition. This year is a quintessential La Nina in both timing and magnitude for a midwinter La Nina. To expect to follow that path, a previous midwinter La Nina periods shown in the graphic to the right. As you can see, the jet stream tends to take the storm track up farther north. It's very cold in the Northern Plains and very wet in the Pacific Northwest, but much drier and warmer in the uh, Southern Plains. Well, Nebraska is kind of sandwiched in between those two. So you would expect to get a little bit of both, but not a strong influence um, 
uh, that say the northern tier states are going to uh, experience. It does indeed mean that drought can be anticipated in the south and the west, particularly in west, uh, south and west Texas, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, and Southern California. Above normal precipitation can be expected in the Pacific Northwest, and that actually includes um, Montana and uh, the Dakotas as well. And so little side note here, um, because uh, while um, climate, is what you expect, weather is what you get. So it's important to have a little background on uh, what the climate has been doing in um, South Central Nebraska uh, over the last 100 years. Here's a look at the annual precipitation from, and I, I realize to, to the um, farmers listening to this, I'm sure you guys know this intrinsically, subliminally, um, just because you experience it, but, uh, it's always good to have a little backup from a uh, statistical uh, standpoint. Um, here's the annual precip, precip in uh, Kearney uh, from 1920 to 2020. As you can see, the annual precipitation for that 101 year period uh, has gone up considerably over that time with increasing variability as well. As you can see, I tagged um, a strong El Nino period in the early 90s, and the uh, last good sized La Nina period from 2010 to 2012. Well, you can see at both those periods, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, so, um, not much to be told by uh, what happened during the El Nino or La Nina period. Other than that, this is 2011 for Carney, that point right there, and the Next year is 2012, which I've already shown you is pretty similar to what's going on right now. And that was uh, considerably below normal uh, precip for South Central uh, Nebraska. So I showed you that the annual precipitation uh, over that 100 year period has been going up, right? Well, oddly enough, the annual average maximum temperature in Kearney has been going down over that same period. Um, uh, I also included what's been going on since 1970 to 2020, which has shown a slight increase in the annual average maximum temperature. Uh, basically what this tells me when I combine with the precipitation map is you're getting more cloud cover, particularly in the afternoon, which is actually keeping the maximum temperatures down um, lower than uh, you would anticipate. Um, and then finally, uh, your annual average minimum temperature, also related to an increased amount of cloud cover, uh, particularly in the last 50 years. Um, as you can see, the long-term trend is actually slowly uh, decreasing in temperature when you look at the last 100 years. But when you look at the last 50 years, your average annual minimum temperature has gone up considerably, actually about a little over a degree and a half um, Fahrenheit. Um, during the last 50 years, something you've probably already noticed, and um, it's important when making a long range forecast. So, what's this all mean for water management in Nebraska for this year? Um, the Climate Prediction Center, which is a NOAA um, division, puts out a three month forecast. They don't go any farther than that, but they have a three month forecast for precipitation on the left and temperature on the right. On the left-hand side, uh, the brown areas are below normal anticipated precipitation, and the green areas are above normal anticipated uh, uh, precipitation. Needless to that, it's pretty synonymous with the map I showed you earlier for what a La Nina year should look like. Um, in this case, uh, it tends that in February, March, and April, um, uh, the area that's in brown should be below normal precip and the green, of course, above normal precip. Combine that with the image on the right, which says below normal temperature of the Pacific Northwest, which should be expected during the La Nina year, and um, uh, slightly above normal temperatures across Nebraska and well above normal temperatures in a very dry uh, Texas. Uh, to get a uh, feeling for where we at um, to begin this portion of the winter with, 
Well, um, the U.S. Drought Monitor says that uh, uh, western portions of Nebraska are already in an extreme drought. Needless to say, what the West Slope of Colorado is um, in an exceptional drought, particularly in Southwest Colorado, um, which is uh, well below normal, below normal precinct for the last year, um, and actually in a drought uh, period for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, so um, we're beginning this year um, already a little behind on precipitation in eastern Nebraska, but um, significantly behind precipitation in western Nebraska. So combined with that, let's look where we're at, we're standing right now uh, with soil moisture um, across the country and in Nebraska. Well, in Nebraska, uh, we're uh, soil moisture is um, slightly behind that orange area there in the west and in the far eastern side of the state and um, somewhat near normal, but still below normal uh, for soil moisture for January 24th. Um, at this moment in time. Uh, but be thankful you aren't growing rice in California because um, they are, their soil moisture is bone dry and considering it is in the middle of winter, although fortunately um, they can anticipate about two weeks uh, worth of uh, wet weather um, uh, into the beginning of February. So I think there will be alleviated by that time. Um, now, uh, not all of you irrigate crops, but uh, some of you do, and many of you, of course, rely on the Platte River um, for that water to come down and uh, pass through your region and, all, uh, as, and supplement groundwater uh, as well. But um, uh, the uh, North Platte Basin snowpack is uh, below normal, only 69% of average at this date and time, um, based on the fact that it is a La Nina year. I don't see any significant um, change in that pattern. And I would anticipate um, the North Platte Basin uh, finishing the year um, at the usual climatological peak uh, at about 70% of average. And as you can see in the South Platte Basin, um, it's not any better. Um, and I would anticipate them finishing out uh, the rest of this year at about 65% of normal when the snow begins to melt off. Uh, hey, what do you know? NOAA and National Weather Service agree with me. This is uh, the NOAA and National Weather Service uh, forecast from this month for spring and summer stream flow. Uh, they anticipate um, the North Platte and the South Platte basins uh, to be in that 50 to 75% of normal range for uh, spring and summer runoff. Um, little side note, uh, I realized that uh, hail and uh, severe weather can cause significant crop damage. Uh, so I included a graphic that helps you better understand that uh, the influences of either tornadoes and or hail during La Nina periods. Um, the one that really, really pops out uh, from this is the uh, anticipated uh, increase in um, uh, hail likelihood, fortunately, much farther south than Nebraska, but over that Arkansas, North Texas, Oklahoma, um, Southern Missouri uh, portion during the La Nina period um, sees uh, considerably more likelihood of, of hail or and or severe weather uh, during a La Nina period. Uh, slightly uh, in Nebraska, only slightly uh, increase in uh, the potential for uh, severe weather during the La Nina period, but um, more so than in, in El Nino period. So what's this all mean? Um, well, here is today's Nebraska forecast for the rest of this water year. Uh, key points uh, based on uh, the hydroclimate indices where we're at in the La Nina cycle, uh, you, you can expect a slightly warmer than normal um, temperatures in spring and summer, slightly drier, drier than normal in spring and summer, below normal July and August precipitation, slightly elevated risk of severe weather. This risk um, would increase from west to east in Nebraska um, with the easternmost uh, uh, southeast corner 
of Nebraska, probably at the highest risk of severe weather. Again, this is uh, not uh, a given. It's just an increased likelihood of severe weather in that region. Uh, Platte River flows should peak early based on the lack of snowpack and uh, be below normal, especially during the summer months. And then finally, on August 21st, 2021, it will be dry in Nebraska. Uh, why do I say that? Is because um, that's what climatology tells us. And that's always the fallback for a long range forecast is the use of a climatological means that says, uh, it's better to flip of a coin that it won't be uh, raining on August 21st in Southern Nebraska. Um, that is uh, the end and uh, hope you've, you found it uh, valuable and or interesting and help you with your decision support. Um, thank you very much. That's great. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. McMahon. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. We've really enjoyed having you um, on with us today and thanks for sharing your contact information. I'm sure folks who have questions um, uh, are encouraged to reach out to you. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, perfect. Well, and again, if uh, for you farmers, you uh, producers out there in the field, um, any resources that we can possibly provide to you from the Nebraska Grain Sorghum Board, that's exactly what we're here for. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our email address is sorghum.board at nebraska.gov. And of course, if you're watching this, you're already visiting our website, which is www.nebraskasorghum.org. Again, thanks a lot. And hopefully in 2022, we'll have this symposium in person. We'll get to see you then. So thank you.